Mr. Josh Bruckner from the Massachusetts Department of Agriculture will be joining us to talk about spotted lanternfly briefly. Hi, um, thanks Liz. Yeah, so um, as she said, I'm Joshua Bruckner from the Mass Department of Agricultural Resources. And there's a very brief introduction to the invasive insect spotted lanternfly, which you can see on the screen right there. Um, so the reason you should be concerned about this is um, it is a pest of concern that has been in the US since 2014 and it is growing quite rapidly. If you go to um, New York IPM's website, you will find a map of where lanternfly is. It is spread throughout much of the Northeast, uh, mostly in Pennsylvania and New Jersey, but it's been found in several Massachusetts municipalities, um, including Boston. Um, it's not established here yet, but it can definitely be at some point. Uh, and it goes after a huge number of different uh, plants. Tree of Heaven is its main host, but it also go goes after a lot of common crops, things like grapes, apples, hops, uh, peaches and plums, cherries. Uh, blueberries, rose, and some very common trees that are used for like timber, lumber, things like maple, uh, black walnut, birch, willow. It has over 70 different host species and given that it favors a lot of agricultural products, um, especially grape, that's one thing that the adults are found on very commonly. It's pretty important to know what this insect looks like and how to report it. Um, so the images you see on the screen right here, this is a poster that we produced. And if you go to the website that is at the bottom, massnrc.org slash pests slash SLF, you will find a couple of different very important resources. Um, our, um, our fact page, which has links to a lot of important things, including a reporting form. So if you find something, you should you know take photos and report it. You can also download this uh, poster where you can present it or give it to people who uh, you think would make good use of it. Um, and you should also definitely be familiar with what it looks like. So um, you can see the adult here at the top of the screen pretty large and to give you a reference, this is what it looks like in real life. Um, you can see like with the wings spread and then when the wings are folded, it um, more resembles this. Um, so you're not always gonna see that bright red wing uh, pre pre uh, presented. Uh, this time of year, the eggs are what you'd find. Uh, you can see the bottom left of that poster, the egg masses look like. Those hatch in late spring, early summer, and then the nymphs emerge. Um, and the adults will be active starting in about July. So this is the right time of year to like kind of keep your eye out for egg masses. Um, and then when it gets warmer, you're gonna want, gonna want to start looking for the nymphs and then the adults. Even though there's no established population in Massachusetts, it's a very mobile insect. So the eggs can be laid on basically any flat surface, including things that would be shipped from quarantined areas like in Pennsylvania up here, like uh, nursery products, the sides of vehicles, packing containers, um, shipping pallets, pretty much anything. The adults and nymphs can hitchhike as well, like just on the underside of a vehicle or like um, there was a gazebo that got built in Massachusetts here and a uh, lanternfly mm -hmm. was hitched onto the lumber that got sent up in Pennsylvania. So a lot of ways this insect could potentially get here. So again, you definitely want to familiarize yourself with what it looks like and be able to report it if you find it. I'm going to put the link to our fact sheet into the chat box right now. So that contains all the important information. Our reporting form is at the top of the page. You can download this and other documents and it'll link you to some other um, significant websites as well. You should also check out our uh, best management practice for nurseries and the green industry and landscapers. That is going in the chat box as well. And um, you can always reach out to me at joshua.bruckner at mass.gov if you have questions about lanternfly. Um, but otherwise, hopefully the fact sheet will answer things. And as I turn this back over to Liz and the experts um, to talk about the main event, I just want you to keep this insect in mind throughout the growing season. Make sure you're checking your trees and any products you get shipped in from other states for signs of the egg masses and the different life stages. Great, thank you so much for bringing that to us today. Yeah, no problem. Next up, I would like to introduce Dr. Terrence Bradshaw. He has worked in the fruit industry for over 25 years as a fruit grower, research technician, and now is the tree fruit and viticulture specialist at the University of Vermont and director of the UVM Horticultural Research Center. His research and outreach projects include evaluation of organic production systems, promotion of IPM, and assessment of apple and grape rootstocks and cultivars. Take it away, Terry. Thanks, Liz. So welcome everyone. Uh, when we were first coming up with the list of topics to, to kind of cover over the course of this winter, 
Uh, I went back to some of the questions that I get. Oftentimes when someone sends me a question, whether it's an undergraduate student or a grower, I assume a lot of other people have that same question. And I've picked up a few from Tree Row Volume. We've got scribbled on my, my list of to-dos here to maybe write a, a new fact sheet about it. Um, it's something that when I came into this business back in 94, 95, was talked about a lot and then uh, has sort of fallen off. Uh, and so I thought it was something worth revisiting. Uh, I'm at the tail end of a two-year grant uh, doing some, what we call the Vermont Beginning Fruit Grower Project. And I kind of tagged this as sort of the last um, um, session for that group, which is a group of, uh, I think we have about 40 people in Vermont that are um, either beginning or, or interested fruit growers who were kind of uh, giving some trainings on some of the basics. And it occurred to me that this, while it was the basics for me back in 95 or so, uh, is something that a lot of people um, don't recognize. So this is kind of, you know, 101 level, but it's sometimes it's a good refresher to have um, to help us understand why this concept matters. So how hard is it to spray stuff? Uh, when we look at some of the research, and uh, when, I, when I say research, I mean some of the efficacy trials, we often see uh, the, in the materials and methods, spray until drip. And that was sort of considered the gold standard of, of applying uh, materials to crops. It doesn't mean that growers actually did spray until drip because there's a tremendous uh, wastage of material and water and time to do that. But you know, how hard is this? We spray a tree, we get it wet. The rate per acre is already established on the label. So as long as we just do the, do the, the algebra, and uh, it, it adds up out in the field, it should be pretty easy um, in theory. When we look at different crops, right, I show a, a vineyard on the left, uh, what a vineyard will look like in, in a few weeks here where your target crop is, or, or your, your, the target of your crop is, you know, a bunch of shoots that are only an inch long and they're four feet off the ground. And then you fast forward just four weeks, uh, five, six weeks, we'll say, and those two shoots have reached all the way to the bottom of the ground. You know, the, the geometry of what we're spraying is different. As we look at, you know, a traditional M7 size orchard or even go back before that to standard trees, and then we fast forward to our modern tall spindle trees, the geometry of doing that, that simple thing that, uh, or that practice that seems so simple really gets a little bit more complicated if we want to try to optimize what we're spraying. So we, we've back in, uh, uh, well, I'll talk about the, the timing of this, but this is the, the concept of tree row volume is really kind of the refinements of a system that worked. And I always love this picture. I, I, I stole it from the University of Maine, but it just shows a great shot, A, of an old orchard tractor, but of, uh, and I don't know when the timing of this was, I'm gonna guess in the 60s, um, of, basically the same technology that most of us are using, unless you know we might have a tower sprayer to move those nozzles around a little bit differently, but th the technology doesn't look a whole lot different than it did 50 years ago, 60 years ago. Um, so these initial labels were designed when we came up with our rates per acre, were designed for some of these legacy materials like Captain, which has been around for 60 years with a with not very different label, uh, were designed when trees were big and there was a lot of volume to fill. Uh, newer orchards, and when I say newer, this is the newer orchards of the 1980s and 1990s. So you had still a freestanding central leader, maybe not trellised, uh, but a semi-dwarf or a dwarf M7, M9, just had less canopy volume. And so it started to make less sense to spray these orchards under this system with the same rates and the same um, uh, you know, math that we're applying to try to get this stuff on there. So it just was starting to make common sense. We also could tell that if we were to, if we're to assume we've got smaller trees, as we do here, some bud nine trees on individual stakes, um, does it make sense to be spraying that same rate per acre when you've got a let, lot less canopy or stuff to catch that per acre? Uh, and so maybe we should start to think about the rate per volume or the, which, which becomes the concentration. So if we're able to reduce the water and the material rates in proportion to the canopy volume, we could save some real money uh, and still maintain a, an effective concentration that would give us the control that we're looking for. So this really came to head 
in terms of uh, the application of, of plant growth regulators, particularly with thinners. So as our tree sizes started to get smaller, the application of thinners under an old label, so using the same rate per acre, would lead to an increased concentration on the plant. And where you have materials that are effective at certain concentrations uh, and increasingly effective at higher concentrations to the tree itself, uh, that can become concerning. So if our concentrations are increasing of an insecticide and therefore we're, we're applying more insecticide per, uh, per unit area, Yes, there may be, there is an environmental uh, trade-off. Um, as long as it's within that safe label constraint, in theory, we can follow that back and assume that we have, you know, we don't have unsafe residues, but we're definitely throwing out extra money into uh, the orchard that we wouldn't have needed to if we had scaled this back to the reasonable size of the tree. But the real penalty for over-application over of thinners is a substantially decreased crop. We're over, we, you know, we have the potential to over-thin. And this became a lot more important to the to the point where to this day we are still seeing um, the, that labels, particularly for plant growth regulators, uh, use tree row volume. And this this has changed a bit. I was actually looking through my collection of old labels, and unfortunately, I find I update them rather than save the old ones because I know there were some labels from maybe 15 years ago, maybe 20 years ago of some legacy materials that had two different rates on there that use both tree row volume and rate per acre. And things have changed a little bit, but this has really stuck around with the use of plant growth regulators. Simple math. Uh, so when, we're, when, we, when we develop uh, or, or calculate our tree row volume, and this is taken right out of the old uh, New England Apple Pest Management or Tree Fruit Management Guide, um, three things we need the height of the tree. And when I say the height of the tree, this is the height of the tree row. Um, so we'd have a, a measuring rod. We've done a couple of different things, both the survey rod. We've also back 20 years ago when we were measuring trees at our horticulture farm, we had a stick that was painted one foot bands, alternate red and white. Uh, and so you would could stand back. You wouldn't have to see the numbers. You could just count the bands and, and one person holds a stick, another person stands back from a distance and you can measure the general height of the canopy, not of the individual trees, because when you're spraying, unless you have a, a, a true crop adapted or, or a, a, a sensor sprayer, you're spraying that general, general canopy um, overall. So it's kind of the, the um, average tree height. And then spin the stick uh, 90 degrees and measure the canopy width. It takes a second person to do that and your row spacing. And after that, it's just simple algebra. Uh, to determine what the volume of that, or I should say geometry, um, of that particular canopy is. Um, there's no, no voodoo behind this. This is just the, the height, as if this thing were a, um, a rectangle of, of canopy going down the rows. Um, subtracting out the row spacing, so, so by dividing by the row spacing, we're, we're removing that blank space within the trees. So this is a theoretical number that we can come up with for our orchards. And then we can use that number, which is the, the, um, the cubic feet. And I'm, I, I, I apologize to our other guest here for not converting this into metric, but our labels will, will follow based upon the imperial units. Imperial units. Um, so our cubic feet will transfer over to a theoretical amount of water that it takes to spray that canopy to drip. So this goes back to our kind of gold standards of how much water it takes to fill that canopy um, of saturated foliage. Now, that doesn't mean we're gonna spray that amount. We're, we, we may spray a reduced amount of that, but that's what determines the amount of material that goes in to maintain the concentration. So usually we assume that it takes 0.7 gallons per thousand cubic feet to saturate that canopy. If you've got an older kind of hairy canopy that's got a lot of excess growth, you might bump that up to one gallon. But again, that's, that's just simple math to do. And if anyone wants this, uh, there's a spreadsheet. Uh, I realize it's just on my hard drive. I don't think it's published anywhere, um, but it's pretty simple math. I just pulled from the formulas we just showed to look at some different uh, dilute gallonages per acre, which is really what matters at the end of the day. The, the spray label does not tell you um, to spray based upon a certain volume. It tells the spray based on a certain um, dilute gallons per acre. So if we look at a theoretical 
you know, MM106, you know, semi-standard tree that's 20 feet tall and you've got 28 feet between, um, uh, or the, and 28 feet wide and with a 40 foot row middle, um, that's some pretty big trees. You're looking at, you know, 427 gallons per acre. And so when you were to mix your, your, your materials, you would base uh, your rate upon that number. So if it says one pound per 100 gallons dilute equivalent, it would be four and a quarter pounds per acre uh, because this is the number of dilute gallons per acre. As we look down at some of the other uh, uh, tree spacings and tree heights and whatnot, we can see that as we get down to um, more narrow canopies, more narrow uh, row widths, we're getting down into the 150, even as low as around 100 dilute gallons per acre. So we've got about a quarter of the actual volume um, in the, um, the, the of, of the volume that we had in, in prior uh, uh, systems. So something that's important to think about is that this assumes a complete row or wall of trees. So a, if you have skips, or so if you've got a lot of dead trees, you've got gaps in the canopy, this isn't really any different, but it, it does not take into account um, that extra loss of space. And I would argue that you actually shouldn't adjust your rate based upon the missing trees. You just don't spray the missing trees. But the bigger issue is if you have canopies that haven't filled out yet. Um, as we've moved to tall spindle trees, you typically are filling that wall in within a couple of years. So it's not as much of an issue when we were spraying um, freestanding central leader trees, you might go several years where those trees aren't overlapping. And if you were to spray a full uh, rate on a much smaller canopy, think about the first year trees that you're spraying with a backpack sprayer or handgun sprayer, um, the, the mixing gets to be a lot more different uh, when you figure that out. So we're assuming a full wall of trees. The other thing that's important to recognize is what I say, precision versus accuracy. So we can, in the winter, we can sit here with spreadsheets and we can really dial in exactly how big our trees are and, and come up with a very specific rate. We can even figure out our nozzles and do all the good calibration stuff. And then when we hop on the sprayer, uh, we realize that in real world conditions, stuff moves around. So if we were to, to hone this down to the smallest DGA that we could apply, you know, our, our 100 DGA dilute gallon per acre, orchard and we mix the minimum we need, uh, we're not accounting for the little bits of, of drift and drip that, that a larger orchard would get. So typically um, you tend to not uh, push that dilute gallons per acre under, you know, I'd say 150 gallons per acre kind of as a minimum rate to mix to. Um, and that's, that's basically how we've, how we've designed things. But the question is, does it really matter? So most of your materials, you know, I look at the, the streptomycin on the left, you can see that there's a um, parts per million. So that's your concentration based on a certain uh, gallons per acre, 600 gallons per acre. This is, remember streptomycin is a legacy product that the label was designed when trees were enormous. Um, we don't apply it 600 gallons per acre anymore. So you will, you will find a chart uh, that tells you how to uh, mix to that rate or it often defaults just back to pounds per acre. So we look at our Roper product, uh, our Mancozeb. Um, this was the one I was looking for, one from about 15 years ago where there was discussion on the label at that time um, about adjusting for tree row volume. And now it's we're, we're right back to pounds per acre. Um, one of the more critical ones, Fruitone, you know, one of our plant growth regulators, um, we can see we're mixing based upon a certain parts per million. There's a chart based in, uh, you know, on this label, tells you how to mix to that part per million. But then at the end of the day, they actually give you some, some clearance and they say, well, use Frotone at four to eight ounces per acre. And then take all these other factors into account to decide between that four and that eight. Uh, and it turns out when you're factoring those, those factors into account, you're probably putting on between five and 15 parts per million. Um, but the labels now start to adjust things a little bit differently. So there's a lot of discussion amongst you know, people in the IPM worlds uh, about the value of tree row volume. And I think it's a little bit less than it used to be as, as uh, more and more labels have gone to a rate per acre, but it really is helpful in particular with these plant growth regulators to really dial things in and, and uh, be able to apply um, without the danger of, of, of over thinning or under thinning. 
uh, because there really isn't any room to, to cut corners in the world of, of uh, plant growth regulators or in the world of, of tall spindle uh, systems. Without further ado, I want to introduce uh, Dr. Jason DeVoe, who's the Application Technology Specialist at the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. He's kind of become the go-to guy in the Northeast uh, and has an absolutely excellent website, www.sprayers101.com. I'll make a point to put that in the chat. Um, that covers so much, not even about just air blast, but just spraying in general, because you know we're using a lot of different types of sprayers. And as orchards have changed, and um, thankfully, a lot of our equipment has changed away from that 1960s uh, sprayer, although I, I would be willing to bet I should have put that as a poll question. How many of you look a, use a sprayer that looked like your grandparents? Um, and thankfully, I've, I've seen some of this uh, talk that Jason gives. Um, he's going to tell us about how to optimize even that old sprayer. All right, I've only done this 800,000 times in the last month alone, but I'm going to ask what every presenter asks anyway. Can you see it? Awesome, pause. Awesome. Looks great. <laughs> okay, I'm going to shrink that poll screen down so I can see. So, um, Terry and I didn't talk a whole lot before this, so I got to tell you, I've given this talk so many times. This is the first time I've ever talked about crop adapted spraying with a tree row volume appetizer. So I wasn't sure what Terry was going to say. I wasn't sure which parts of tree row volume he would adhere to. But I tell you, the last thing I want to do is come in and uh, mess things up. Everything Terry said was bang on. The limitations, the math. And what I really like is I don't do a lot with plant growth modifiers because they're black magic. Um, and you know, you it's so imperative to get that right. Tree row volume is a great way to do something repeatedly. It's quantitative. So if you like the results you're getting, there's no need to change that unless there's something wrong. Um, crop adapted spraying is mostly pertinent to fungicides and insecticide applications, but let's just dig in. There's gonna be some redundancy here. I've chosen to decide Let's, let's just say we're gonna hit things twice to make sure you really got the message instead of it being redundant. We'll all pretend it's not redundant. So a couple of definitions before we get rolling. Uh, dilute volume, what does that mean? It means the outside of the canopy is dripping, the inner canopy got reasonable coverage and you have a dilute volume when the, you have a match between the canopy surface area and how efficient your sprayer is getting the liquid to it. That volume defines how much product should be applied at a rate per planted area. It's everything Terry said. Concentrated volumes change everything. They're well below the point of runoff. Uh, very few people are dilute spraying anymore. They're leaning more into concentrate. The idea is to hold the product application rate per planted area the same as the dilute rate. But to do that, you're gonna have to change the concentration. And again, that's just what Terry said. But what I wanna do with this talk is tell you where some of these facts quote unquote, come from. And believe it or not, I'm going to erode your confidence a little bit in, in pesticide labels. A few more definitions. When I'm talking about dose, I'm talking about how much actual product lands on the target. And for our purposes, let's say that's a laminar surface like a leaf. And we're talking about how many micrograms per centimeter squared of surface deposit. When I say coverage, I'm talking about the spread of those deposits on the target. That's actually two things. It's how many drops you get per square centimeter, a density, and it's also how much of the surface gets covered. And if you have a hard time tearing those two ideas apart, just imagine peppering a leaf with droplets at an even distance and getting say 5% coverage, and then taking another leaf, leaf and just dipping it just a bit into liquid, also getting 5% coverage, but it's all in one spot. Those are two different kinds of coverage, even though you have the same absolute value. So you need to know how deposits are distributed as well as how much of the target is covered to get coverage. And all of this boils down to efficacy, which is what we're all chasing for. It's product specific, but in order to get efficacy, you've got to have the right dose and you got to have the coverage. Tree row volume, what it attempts to do is address the problem of matching a dilute spray volume and the rate to the canopy size. Again, just like Terry said, and in the fifties, this is a standard apple canopy, and this forms the basis of the original tree row volume. Your tree is 20 feet high, 23 feet wide, 
and on a 35 foot row. And that was successfully sprayed with about 400 US gallons per acre. Nice round numbers like that give me pause by the way. But this was a decision, this was an assumption. If everybody can get away with this, then we're gonna call this the standard that we're gonna to aspire to. And here's some of that math. There's your, uh, your width and your height and a, a constant and your row spacing. And you can see how many square feet of canopy were in a standard apple orchard per acre. If that was successfully sprayed with 400 gallons an acre, we can say roughly it takes one US gallon to spray 1500 cubic feet of canopy. Now bear with me, this changes, it evolves, it gets twisted. But this is the standard that the original tree roll volume aspired to. We don't have a lot of standard apple orchards anymore. I think the last one I saw in Ontario got uh, pulled down about eight or nine years ago. It was beautiful to see, but super inefficient. So tree roll volume allows us to cope. Here's a more realistic uh, set of parameters, the geometry of an orchard, 11 foot by seven foot, 12 foot spacing. And there's the same constant for how many square feet per acre. Well, it looks like this orchard only has half-ish of the cubic feet of canopy to spray per acre. And if we use our coverage standard, we should hypothetically be able to spray this thing at a dilute volume about 200 US gallons per acre. And that's that pro rata cut. If we've got half the volume of tree, maybe we need half the volume of water. This is one of the original apps long before smartphones. I got a couple of these and they're just glorious. These slide rules were some of the original tree row volume spraying rate calculators. This was from Virginia Cooperative Extension in 86. And you can look at this and go, wow, look at the math. I mean, how could you not believe in this? You've got to make all these adjustments. They all affect each other, but I just love the underlying caution. Uh, whatever number you get, it could be 20% more or less than that. Yikes. Um, a little less confident in this now. That's, that's a big margin, 40%. And let's look at some of the assumptions. Uh, I don't know how many of you actually have cuboid trees, but uh, they don't, there aren't many of them. If you look at the cross section of a tree canopy, that end row profile, you could see a very different shape. And when you use that shape, geometry tells us it's not a cube, it's a sphere or a, 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 a spade or something else that when you work out the geometry, it doesn't have the same volume of canopy. So now you get these little prorata cuts at the bottom. If your tree is cuboidal, then it's one times tree row volume. You don't make any change. But as that volume of canopy goes down, you can start making cuts in how much volume you actually need. Europe has a, their own method called the half crown height. They don't measure the drip line of the canopy. They measure halfway up and take that width. And that gives a kind of an average width. So, okay, now tree row volume is assuming what a standard orchard was. It is assuming how much volume it took to spray it. It's assuming the shape of the tree. And there's more. That tree doesn't stay the same throughout the season. If you sprayed a tree between tight cluster and full leaf, you're going to see a 20% increase in how much leaf or how much tree there is to spray. And what that means is if you spray at the same volume at both of those stages of development, you could see spray deposits change from like 1.2 to two times higher at tight cluster. Just think of it as spreading it thin. If there's more tree to spray, then that same volume of liquid is going to get spread over a larger area. And this begins to tell us we need to make changes based on the age of the tree or even the time of season, maybe. A state of growth factor was suggested for this, but only for some situations, because some people thought, you know what, I'm, I'm going to put extra volume on the tree during uh, uh, tight bud or, or, or flowers. Well, that's, those are critical applications. I'd rather have excessive coverage at that point than try to claw back a few bucks worth of water and pesticide, because it's just so important. Maybe we can just keep the same volume from the beginning of the season to the end and eat the fact that we're spraying too much at the beginning. And there are different views on that. And none of these take into account my favorite little saying that at Christmas time, it's not the size of the box, it's what's in the box. Work by Cross et al in around 2000 in England, they recognize that the height of the tree and the density, what's actually in it, may be the biggest factors in how much volume we need to spray. And tree row volume may or may not take that into account. So 
what I'm saying here is we're making all of these mathematical adjustments. Terry talked about algebra, but it quickly becomes geometry and then maybe even calculus. We're making these assumptions that we're making the right moves based on what? The label. Where does that information even on the label come from? Label rates, again, as Terry pointed out, are generally going towards planted area. That is to say, put on this much product per planted area acre. Uh, it's not like that in, say, New Zealand or, or uh, a lot of Eurasian countries where it's per 100 meter row. But that's a whole other discussion. The labels are not based on the shape or density of the canopy, not always, uh, or the planting architecture. That's the row spacing. They're just this per acre rate. And that's no good. There's just too much variability between orchards and even within the same orchard over the year. And a per area rate just doesn't give us the flexibility we need. And those labels are based on field crops. Um, there are toxicity calculations, there are maximum residue calculations, there are drift calculations that are really easy to do if you do it from a per area rate. And it works super duper for corn. There's not a ton of variability from one field to the next, um, even if they're malnourished or there's a slight difference in planting, not like an orchard. In fact, look at the variability. There's the target. Is the tree pruned? How old is it? What shape is it? What species? What's your row spacing? There's your equipment. What kind of sprayer are you using? If it's a garbage sprayer with very little transfer efficiency, that is whatever you release from the sprayer, only a bit of it gets where it's supposed to go. That's going to matter. How is it configured? Do you have it set up right? How well maintained is it? You know, uh, calibration. There's the method you're using. Maybe you're a concentrated applicator, maybe dilute. Perhaps you're using an ultra low volume sprayer. Maybe you're driving every second or even third row. Please don't do that. And the environmental conditions. Advice that we would give on one coast when it's humid and cool is exactly the wrong advice for the West Coast where it's hot and dry and droplets can evaporate and maybe their survivability isn't there. None of this is on the label and very little of it is captured by tree row volume. In fact, a lot of the data on our labels come from small plot studies on small trees from hand applied sprays at dilute volumes. And a number of years back, I grabbed 150 random minor use label expansions. This is where a registrant or an agrochemical company wants to make a change to their label. Maybe there's a new crop, maybe there's a new rate. Uh, how do they do that research? Well, just this survey shows us it's quite the dog's breakfast. Sometimes they test with air blast sprayers, but sometimes hand booms or hand guns or backpack mist blowers or no air assist over the row booms. We've got good representation from all of them. Does that matter? Well, we did a quick comparison. We compared the spray coverage from the commercial air blast sprayer, and we did this in a number of three-dimensional hort crops, to uh, the classic CO2 backpack sprayer. And I built this one. It's the, the best sprayer I could put together. And we looked at coverage. What if both of these systems sprayed the same volume? What kind of coverage distance, differences would they get? And gosh, it was huge. That messy graph on the left, the, uh, that shows you the percent coverage, how much of a, a water sensitive paper was covered by spray after it was sprayed by a number of different systems. Um, if you hold the volume the same and use two different systems to spray, you're gonna see massive changes in how much spray arrives on the target. That's all this is meant to show. The graph on the right, it shows a count of how many deposits, how many actual droplets landed. And it's pretty similar to the percent coverage. They're just not even close to one another. In fact, we flooded a, a, the grape plant so badly with air blast spraying at the same volume as a hand boom that we had to do it again with half the volume. And it was still twice the coverage of a hand boom. So we have a disconnect here. We have a disconnect between how the label information is developed and how the grower actually uses that information to try to succeed. And it's, in, it's inevitable that it's going to affect harvest quality and environmental contamination, certainly economics. And you know, if it really gets botched, there's potential for pest resistance. Ideally, with tree roll volume and labels, do you know what would be great? If we knew that they were spraying a reference canopy, this is the tree we're spraying. And this is how we calibrate the sprayer. And this is the sprayer we used. And we know we got good coverage if we see this. 
If all that was transparent, our job would just be to copy it. Okay, we know that this is the coverage they got in that tree. I need to get the equivalent coverage in my tree. If I have more tree and I can, I need more to do it, then I will. If I have less tree and I don't need as much to do it, so be it. Until then though, tree row volume does provide a good partial solution, particularly for plant growth regulators. I mentioned spraying as a dark art. This is, we're gonna switch gears real quick. We're gonna go into the way that I like to do things. And I, I don't have Terry's pedigree in 94, 95. I had no idea about agriculture. I was still in university and honestly, I had no idea this was even a job. I started in 2008 and it was an awesome eye-opening experience and tree row volume wasn't really around at that point. So I ended up with a different perspective and I'm kind of happy I did because I worked backwards. What I like to do is think about what it is we're trying to achieve. What should coverage look like? And once I know what coverage looks like, I'll do anything in my power to make that happen. We'll talk about this. The crop adapted spraying method, and that's not my name. This is, this is from Australia. This method has been around a long time. It sort of draws from a lot of the tree row volume methods. It draws from a lot of dose expression models that I won't bore you with. And it cherry picks, no pun intended, the best and easiest parts of all of it. If you do this correctly, your goal is to reduce coverage variability. That means less drenching in some spots, less missing in others. That's both in the block and between the blocks. If you do it right, you're gonna reduce waste. And that means you may save pesticide. Our objective isn't necessarily to save water and product. Our objective with crop adapted spraying is consistent coverage. We found that doing this gives you par or better efficacy, even if you do save water and do save product. And what I like about it is it's qualitative and it makes sense. You're probably doing a lot of these things now, but you're doing them without guidance. And that means you're doing them inconsistently, turning off a nozzle, maybe speeding up a bit. And if something goes wrong, you have no way to track back to figure out what the cause was. This formalizes uh, the decisions that you're already making. And to be clear, it's not, for, it's not for this sort of scenario. <laughs> Crop adapted spraying can't help this. This is sheer brute power trying to get a drop to the top of a wicked huge tree. So if we're talking tree nuts, citrus, this isn't for you. This is the situation we're talking about. The ability to get all the red out. Honestly, in the window here, that's, that's ideally as far as we want spray and air to go. Everything else is a waste of money. Everything else is an environmental contamination. We don't want it. It's the difference between efficiency and inefficiency. And if I haven't beaten this horse to death yet, when I show up at an operation, this is fairly typical of what I see. Um, I'll ask them to spray with the sprayer completely unadjusted just so I can find these trouble zones. How much is blowing over? How much is blowing under? How much is blowing through? Are there any gaps in the pattern? Are there any really uh, dense volumes where you're going to end up with wasteful drenches? Sometimes you have to, by the way, but not always. And how can we turn that into this, which should be our objective? I wish I could just give you four steps and send you on your way, but there are enough sprayer designs out there to make you throw up in the back of your mouth a little bit. And good advice for one particular sprayer design in one environment against one target can be completely wrong for the next person. So I have to find a way to make this qualitative and I have to find a way to make it fit for all these different scenarios. Here are the steps. I mean, if I were to put this as a flow chart, the first thing you're gonna do is adjust the air settings. And if it's good, great, we move on to the next step. If it's bad, and I'll explain this, you have a lot of choices because you all have different orchards and you all have different pressures and I don't know if you're willing to say adjust your travel speed or if your sprayer has deflectors or how well you can adjust your fan speed or even if you're willing to prune the canopy, but they're all options to improve the match between air and sprayer. If that works, I'm seeing, sorry, uh, sprayer, air and target. If that works, we move to the next step and we assess coverage. I prefer using water sensitive paper. I'll get into that in a second. If you don't like what you see, what can you do? Turn nozzles on and off change nozzle rates in those positions, maybe change the spray quality or the spectrum of droplet sizes in those positions. Even the spray angle 
for movable heads can help. Once you're happy, you fill the sprayer per usual. And this is where we'll, we'll get into this. That is to say, I have to make certain assumptions with this crop adapted spraying. Because the labels don't tell us what we need to know, we're forced to make assumptions the way we made with tree roll volume from the 50s. You fill the sprayer the same way you always did. The same amount of product to the same amount of water. If that doesn't work out, and there are situations where it doesn't, I'm thinking sulfur and grapes, certainly plant growth regulators, maybe strep, then you may have to adjust the volume, I'm oh, sorry, the concentration for the job. But there are fewer situations like that. And then you monitor. You gotta watch. If it's working, terrific. If it's not working, don't immediately think it's crop adapted spraying. It could be timing, it could be product choice. And if you wanna bail, then there's no harm in going back to higher volumes. If it works, it becomes the new normal. And it's great and it has worked. Um, you just have to remember, you need to keep assessing the situation, particularly when weather conditions or the crop grows and changes because it's just not the same target anymore. So number one was air handling. It is the most important and least understood mechanical system on the sprayer. It does it all. It opens the canopy. It moves and exposes parts of the canopy. It carries the droplets to the target because without the air, fine droplets, which are what most of our sprayers produce, would never go where we want them to. And just think about throwing a feather. You increase the pressure or throw a feather super hard, and then you lighten the pressure and throw a feather gently, what happens? It may go a little farther. It may change direction a bit, certainly not in relation to the additional effort you put into it. Mostly it just does what it wants. Fine droplets like feathers are buoyant and they react to the environment around them. Without air, they're not gonna go where, they, where you want them to go, which is why it's always the critical first step. And your objective, is to get that spray, that spray filled air from the sprayer into the target canopy. You don't wanna push so hard, like the middle, that you blow it out the back end. That's just a waste. And it actually messes up the coverage at the front of the, of the canopy. That's not what you're looking to do. At the top, you see that empty air has been displaced by spray, by a spray laden air. That situation's great for every second row. You do one pass, you've done the job but I like the bottom the best for a lot of reasons that I, we don't have time for. But really you want the spray to get past the halfway point on the canopy and not pass out. Then when you come back on the other side, you spray that side, you get two angles of attack and you get an overlap in the middle where it's really hard to get spray. That's my preferred method and that's our objective. So how do you see air? Old growers trick, doesn't mean it's wrong, works beautifully. You tie a few 10 inch ribbons at the top, middle and bottom of the canopy that you're spraying. You tie them on the upwind side so it's as challenging as it can get. And you drive by with the air on. Now the one you really have to watch is the top one. It is the hardest place to reach for any sprayer. It's gotta move. If your sprayer doesn't make that dance a little bit, then you don't have enough, you don't have enough air getting up there and displacing that part of the canopy. If it's a really big tree, you may not move the middle and bottom ribbons because the spray only gets about halfway and doesn't make it out, which is actually ideal. So you've got to watch the way the leaves move. But this qualitative method, this easy approach is a way for you to determine a lot of neat things. If you don't like the way things are going, you can speed up or slow down the sprayer. Maybe you have to adjust the fan angle, the deflectors. Maybe you have to adjust the fan speed. You just want to see it waffle and no more. And just a, a tip about travel speed, people tend to use it as a way to get done faster, as a work rate tool, as a, an efficiency tool, and, and it is. But that shouldn't be the primary use of travel speed. The primary use of travel speed, particularly with low profile sprayers, is to ensure that the air has enough time to push all the other air out of the way. As you can see from this image, if you slow down, your spray will go higher and deeper. If you speed up, it'll bend. You won't go quite so deep and you won't go quite so high. That's a tool for you to use to adjust the swath. The ribbon test, which because I changed my slide deck before I sat down and I promised myself I would never do that again, but I've still done it. This actually should have occurred before you put ribbons in the tree. I apologize. This is truly the first step. All it does is tell you whether your deflectors, which you can see here on the bottom, are in the right place. 
you can see if uh, it gives you a hint as to which nozzles should be on or off as you extrapolate from the ribbons. You do this right in the canopy and you have someone behind the sprayer being very careful, look. The ribbons will tell you whether or not those nozzles ideally are going to hit the canopy or go over or under. It's gonna tell you if you're wasting it on the ground. It's even gonna tell you if you're using an older sprayer, if you've got a skew. That is to say, you don't have straightening vanes inside or outside the fan. And if you don't, you should be able to compensate for them with the deflectors. And if you don't have those, at least you should be aware of it. Now, you'll notice I haven't done anything with nozzles yet. Uh, that's because we have to talk about coverage and water sensitive paper is my go-to feedback method. Yes, there are dyes, you can use kale and clay, you can look for drip, you can look for runoff, you can look for residue, but they're hard to quantify. They take a lot of time. So I've used this method for years and years and working with David Mantelow out of New Zealand, uh, I kind of married my chocolate to his peanut butter. He was missing something for a coverage standard and I was missing something for how to distribute these throughout a canopy. And he had the data to back this up using uh, bioassays with powdery mildew and it's super duper. So this, this close up magic trick, this six step thing, it's not so tough. You pull a handful of the papers out, you flip the top one over because if you touch these papers with your fingers, they'll turn blue. I hope you're familiar with these. Uh, water sensitive paper is just that. It goes from yellow to blue when liquid touches it. Anyway, you use that folded paper to bend them all over and then you kind of uh, crease that stack and drive a thumbnail, a thumbtack through the corner and just throw them all in a Ziploc bag till you're ready to use them. And when it's time, you can pin them into petioles, you can pin them into twigs, you can put them wherever you like. So what are we looking for? It kind of depends. Uh, this is not for an ultra low volume sprayer, I'll say that. This is for a, a standard hydraulic style uh, nozzle. And you can see this, this, this spread, this gradient of not enough to too much. Uh, likely not enough are the three papers on the left. Likely too much is the three on the right, believe it or not. Your goal should be 85 drops per square centimeter and 10 to 15% coverage. And you want to see that on 80% of the papers in the tree. And that sounds pretty specific, isn't it? And I don't want to pull the wool over your eyes. Um, there's no math behind this. There's just lots and lots of experimental, uh, sorry, uh, anecdotal evidence. There's a lot of looking at how registrants spray uh, between the three experts that helped work this up, Mark Lederborough, uh, David Mantelow and myself, we've never seen this go bad is, is all I can say. You look at the coverage and you think it's partially where the droplets are, but it's also where the droplets aren't. If there's a possibility of something landing between the droplets, a spore let's say, or an insect could make its way through if it's motile, you just kind of use your gut. And we've seen 85 drops per square centimeter, 10 to 15% coverage work again and again and again and again. It's a decent line in the sand to draw. So how did it, how did it work? Why did it work? Here are three different trees, large, medium, and small, orchard one, orchard two, and orchard three. And let's say our label on the left, and I have to apologize now, I've used metric. Oh no, I've got them both, yay me. Uh, let's say the orchard on the left, the, the label says 100 gallons per acre. And you spray at 100 gallons per acre with a certain concentration. You've put so much product in your tank and you pluck a leaf off and you look and you see that pattern of droplets. And you go, okay, I know that's good coverage because I know that's an efficacious application. It's always worked for me. Then for the tree in the middle, let's say you can get that exact same pattern, but only use half the spray mix. You haven't changed the concentration. Every drop on those leaves is in the same spot as the one on the left with the same amount of dissolved active ingredient. In other words, your tree will know no different. It has no idea how much you sprayed per hectare or per acre. It just knows it's received a consistent dose with the same coverage. And in extreme situations on the right, there you have 25 gallons per acre. You can do the same thing. So the concept is maybe we don't need to change the concentration. And again, there are exceptions. Uh, plant growth modifiers and sulfur jump instantly to mind. Some need a, a minimum amount of product per plant area to function, but not all of them. In fact, the, the vast majority don't. So this is how it works. We're filling in all the misses. We're getting rid of the drenches. Anything that was wasted doesn't need to be sprayed in the first place. 
And ideally, if the concentration and the cover stay the same, the tree knows no different. Now, sometimes it's not the sprayer. You can tweak and poke and set that thing up. It's physics. At some point, it may not be able to do the job. Sprayer calibration and adjustment must take place in the presence of the canopy. Makes no sense to calibrate your sprayer in a parking lot. You need to see how they react to the canopy and vice versa. And if you can't get any more out of the sprayer, it may be time to look at the canopy. This example in hops is, a, is, is good because it's just super obvious and we all know it. If there's no target on the left, we don't need a lot of air energy, very little volume per acre, let's say. And we certainly don't need all the, all the nozzles on, but as the crop changes in shape, as the crop changes in density, we need to change with it. Hops is a super example of a sprayer that should be completely fundamentally different at the end of the season than it was at the beginning. And you can't just assume it's always going to work. Getting out of the sprayer on occasion to throw up a few pieces of water sensitive paper is a brilliant move. And it's getting dry. It's getting windy. I think I'm pushing stuff. I got half a tank left though. I want to make sure that it's getting there or it's a waste of time. And if it's not getting there, you should feel comfortable in making some changes on the fly. Maybe you do slow down a bit. Maybe you do up your pressure to get a bit more flow, or maybe you pack it in. So these qualitative steps, uh, you're taking a lot on faith. I want to show you some numbers from a three-year project in Blueberry, and we're almost done. Uh, in 2017, when we showed up, the grower had a KWH sprayer, kind of like a Kinkelder, a big air share system designed for massive apple canopies. And that's what he was using to spray high bush Blueberry because it's the sprayer that came with the berry patch when he bought it. But he knew it was super wasteful. And spotted wing Drosophila was kicking his butt and he, he needed to make changes. So in 2018, we got a new sprayer, a, a more efficient sprayer, a smaller sprayer. And we used the crop adapted spraying system, spray to coverage, turn off the nozzles that aren't needed, back the air off, make the coverage consistent and meet that threshold. And he saved a lot of money. Um, that wasn't the goal, but it was a nice little side effect. And this doesn't matter if you do it for one year, but we did it for three. So for three years, we ran crop adapted spraying. He sprayed what he wanted, when he wanted. He just maintained the concentrations he normally would have used. Uh, if we look at it as water, if water is a pressing issue where you are, that's a lot of potential for saved water. And that translates to less refills and a faster work rate. Sometimes even if you have to drive a little slower to achieve coverage, that'll be enough to tip it back in your favor. And of course, what does that mean to efficacy? This is an odd, God awful thing to show you, certainly through the internet like this. But all I want to show you is in 2016, before we got there, look at the numbers in the top right. He was pulling off about 12,000 flats of berries. In 2017, 18,000 flats of berries. All he did was buy a new sprayer. We didn't make any big changes at that point. 2018, down to like half of his existing volume and, and, and chemistry per acre, same number of flats, same efficacy. Uh, in 2019, the, the bottom fell out of the blueberry market. He stopped harvesting early, but we were on point to end up with the same harvest. And of course, 2020, the world ended. We, uh, we didn't know if we were getting seasonal workers, so they over pruned just to keep everything in shape. So they, they didn't need as many hands, so it doesn't really count. But it worked beautifully in blueberry. And it worked in apple. When I first tried it in 2013, we had three, we had four orchards. Uh, all different spacings, all different varieties. They all had different ideas about what they were spraying and when they were spraying. We just put these methods in place, adjust the air, work for coverage, this much, no more. A calibration, in fact. And after three years of scouting every week for every pest, we saw no significant difference in the control of any of those pests. And they saved about an average 25% in the spray mix. Uh, we did destructive apple sampling, and this is just tally, really. We grabbed random apples each year from these orchards, and we just counted every imperfection we could find. So, you know, if you're doing export, you have a lower threshold for, for Mars on the apple. Um, if it were crab apples, who cares? But if you look at control and treatment, control and treatment for those three orchards, there was always improved cleanliness on the apples when they paid more attention using crop adapted spraying. And I confess it's a bit of a red herring. If you're paying that much attention to your coverage, getting rid of drenches and filling in misses, of course you're going to end up with cleaner apples. It really doesn't matter how much you sprayed on the orchard floor. That's why it works. 
So how do you put this into play yourself? Um, consider crop adapted spraying. Consider looking at coverage as your metric for how much volume and how much product you need. And don't jump in full bore, especially this time of year where we're all anxious about buds and frost. Like this, this maybe isn't the time to consider it, or, or perhaps it is, but start slow. Maybe do a couple of rows or one block, monitor it, figure out what it takes to get it to work for you, and then expand the program as you get used to it. The first time you try this, you're going to have a hard time figuring out how much spray mix you're going to need to do an acre. You may have some left over at the end, right? We, we, have, to, we have to account for that. And keep detailed records. Uh, just like making a great recipe for somebody, a good meal, and you go, wow, how did I do that? I want to do that again. Or that was horrible. What did I do wrong? Keeping good records, changing only one thing at a time, you know, solid science, the empirical method, that's the way to adapt your operation with crop adapted spraying. And if it seems a little hokey or a little too easy, recognize there are sprayers coming now that do this automatically. I've told you the value of adjusting air and how important it is because it gets the spray to the target, your transfer efficiency goes up. I've told you the importance of looking at good coverage, not too much, not enough. I've told you the holes in the labeling system and how we are forced to make assumptions and do the best we can. Look at this cat. As this drives along, it uses a LIDAR system to determine the density of the crop. It's working out its own tree row volume as it drives. It says, I have this much crop and I have my own idea of what a coverage factor should be. That is, if I see a cubic meter of foliage, I need to do this to compensate. And it doesn't just change how much liquid comes out, it even changes how much air is used to convey it, which will put me out of work and I can't wait. If this thing works the way Jacto in Brazil says it does, this is the future. The only thing that's missing from this system is a feedback loop, a mechanism for it to determine if it did what it thought it did. We use water sensitive paper for that but they're developing digital water sensitive paper that can remain in your orchard so that the sprayer says, I did this and assumed that got there, did it? And then this little Bluetooth digital pickup says, yep, it got here or nope, it didn't. It must be dry out, up your volumes. Long ago, I created an app called Orchard Max and you can think of it as a kind of a crop adapted spraying and tree row volume decision-making tool. It's no different than that slide rule I showed you in the beginning. Um, it's free and it's available through Sprayers 101 if you wanna try it. It does more than just give you hints towards how much volume you'll need and uh, how much product you'll need, but it also works out work rates. So it can help you figure out how many tanks you're gonna need, how long it'll take. It's an interesting tool for working out your efficiencies and work rates. And I don't know what the rest of you did during COVID, but I wrote a book. Um, working with Mark Lederborough and, and David Mantelo, we decided to update the book I wrote five years ago. And this is just a quantum leap above what that other book was. And uh, it was horrible. I, I've never spent so much time yelling at somebody from my kitchen table, but particularly between Mark and I, we produced something that neither of us could have produced alone. And we're quite proud of it. And it's entirely free and it's meant to be applicable no matter where you are or what crop you're spraying with what air blast sprayer design. So I encourage you to go to Sprayers 101 and download your free digital copy. Um, but if you prefer paper the way I do, there's an option there for print on demand and that costs whatever it costs to print it and send it to you. And as Terry was kind enough to point out, Sprayers 101 is a website that's nothing but resources in spraying, uh, all cropping systems and sprayers that Dr. Tom Wolf and I out of Saskatoon uh, curate and generally populate, although anyone that has a good article is always welcome to contribute it. Again, it's free, we're beholden to nobody. We don't take sponsorship. We're just there to produce the best information we can for you. So it has a very robust search engine. You can go on and type in any keywords and you'll find videos and calculators and articles, uh, even some bad goofy videos that Tom and I like to think are funny. So that's the end of my tirade. I have no idea how long it took. I'm pretty sure I went over time. We are actually great on time right now. Um, My mouth is so dry. I talked a mile a minute. <laughs> um, so this would be a great time for folks to start asking some questions. And Jason, I want to thank you. I think you timed that just right. Actually, that was that was uh, as as one who talks for a living. Um, that was well paced. Wow. Thank you. Thanks. 
I'm wondering what you're thinking about inviting me now. If, if I unraveled everything you've been diligently trying to sew up, I'm sorry. No, no, no. It's, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the, the issue I think that is often had is that um, when labels are written and when people fill tanks, they're, the piece that's missing is how well is this stuff hitting the canopy, right? So you can, totally. your concepts all fit within that. It's, it's basically a refinement of, is this stuff hitting the canopy? Is this getting where we want to go with it? Um, and if you do it right, if you bring it to its logical extreme and you cut out all the red that was in there, you're going to save time, you're going to save money, and you'll likely be within the label rates. Although maybe you're going to be applying less with, with smaller stuff. That's, that's, I doubt you'll be applying more. I can't, no, I can't imagine so a scenario I, I should, there. I should say that now. So now is my public service announcement. There Anyone that attempts to interpret a label, it's different for each state. It's different in each country. Um, but the one thing that's the same, whether you're allowed to do it or not, is that it's your butt. Whoever advised you to go off label is the person liable. And generally that downloads to the person that filled the sprayer. So if you choose to do this, uh, and I, I'll suggest you're probably already doing it already, but, but with, without that kind of guidance, um, you're the one liable. So recognize that it's, it's hard from state to state. My colleagues, people I respect immensely, some people can talk about this. And some people, it is verboten. They, they're not permitted to talk about adjusting rates. You can never exceed a labeled rate, ever. Maximum residue limits, restricted entry, uh, toxicological information, don't go there. It's never a good idea. But if you can use less because it ends up on the ground or in the air, I'll just say again, what was the point of spraying it in the first place? The tree knows no different. But look at a recirculating sprayer. Effectively, every recirculating sprayer out there, which we hold on high as being a great environmental sprayer, and if you're not familiar, it sprays through the target into a kind of a shroud that slurps it back up and puts it back in the tank. They're all off-label. By the time you get to the end of an acre, you've recovered 30, 40, 50% early season. So to be on-label, if I can be facetious, you got to open the tank and dump it in an alley. It, it's just that ridiculous. It's not sensible. But we haven't found a way to give clear cut advice because of how different labels are formulated, how they're, how they're researched and all the different cropping systems and sprayer systems and abilities of the operators. It's tricky. So the labels just kind of give loose guidance and leave you to it. I never thought that was fair. So we got a couple of questions that are coming in that maybe I'll uh, start to pull out. So first one is what are the options for on the fly in pre-spray air adjustment? Well, Terry, you know the sprayers in your area. It, it depends on the design. If you're running a positive displacement pump that's not centrifugal and your PTO trailed and your sprayer has, sorry, your tractor's got about 20% extra capacity horsepower, you can do something called gear up, throttle down. What that means is you gear up the tractor and you throttle back some your fan will turn slower. And with a positive displacement pump with enough, enough additional capacity, you may need to make a little tweak on your regulator, but your, your liquid rate will stay the same. So that's a way to disengage liquid from air. That's one option. Um, more I'll simple. mention that. So that's what I actually do in, in our orchard. Uh, and I say, when you say positive displacement pump, you're talking about Piston diaphragm diet, pumps usually. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's what most of our rear rear sprayer. Although I know some sprayers are using centrifugal pumps, and I guess that's that's the important thing to note is yeah, you'll you can potentially throw your rate off. Well, or your flow you, rate. If, if you back off the RPMs on the centrifugal pump, the flow just goes like it it just yeah. dies. It, you may have a little capacity to do it, but it's tricky. And if you start going uphill mm -hmm. at the same time, it's just a dog's breakfast. So I don't recommend it. Um, an easier option, of course, is if your fan has a fan gear, high and low, and if you've never moved it, hit it with WD-40 and get ready for an afternoon. Just kind of manually move the fan into gear, obviously, not while anything's on, and just give her. Um, the more sophisticated sprayers, though, they'll allow you to use hydraulics or electrical to speed up or slow down your fan. And, of course, there's travel mm -hmm. speed, which I showed. If you can't help but blow through the target, I'm giving you permission to be Mario Andretti as long as you don't hit anyone. And at about seven kilometers an hour, four or five miles an hour, it gets a little freaky. Like it's a scary thing when you're zipping through a high density orchard and 
you got to make sure you're a good driver. You're going to just fence post yourself or hit some poor bugger that you didn't know was out there. But travel speed should be used as a tool to adjust fan. I wouldn't mess with blade pitch unless your sprayer was designed to do it. And there are some Curtex and um, ultra low volume sprayers that do allow you to change the pitch of the blade. But on a, a radial air blast sprayer, you might try it once and never do it again. And I don't like donuts. Mm -hmm. Stay away from them. They'll, they'll cause trouble. They can cavitate your fan. I know in Washington, they had some dangerous situations. And I don't like the idea of plywood on the back of an air blast spray that you can't clean. So that's not my preference. And to highlight the, the donut, that was something that was popular maybe 10 years ago or so. Uh, that uh, was a way to basically make a plywood, uh, 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 what do I want to say, guard that went over the shroud that you could open up to varying, kind of like the top of your barbecue grill um, that lets more air in or out. Um, and I agree that cavitation was always an issue. If you were to close off a bunch of air and that, and that fan is still spinning at the same speed, you're going to cause some potential real um, uh, you know, gear wear yeah. and just, just yeah. wear out you know, uh, the system. It's funny. They, they worked on the suction side. It would have been so much out more awesome if they worked on the output. Like a, I know Cornell was fooling around with Andrew Landers was working on adjustable louvers yeah. where you could just block some of the air. Throttle when it you, out. When you do that, you increase the laminarity. Like you're going to change your, your speed of your air, but you're going to cut back on your volume. So there were tricky ways that that would work. That was the better choice than, than messing with the suction side. I think so that's really another question. Important. Oh, George, you pop in and I'll get this next question ready. Jason, I think that was really important because if you are looking at some of the European type sprayers, they may have a plastic type of fan instead of the steel uh, fans. And those are the ones that were literally being destroyed by cavitation. So that's really, really important uh, that we don't restrict that airflow on the suction side because it can be very, very dangerous. Thanks, George. I didn't know it was the nylon fans that were doing it. I thought it was just ripping up all the uh, all the bearings inside a, a, a metal fan, but that's good to know. Just what you want, shrapnel flying off at so many miles an hour. Yeah, right. Um, so a question here has come up. Uh, issue for us is, is that one tank will be applied to row widths from 12 feet to 15 feet to 18 feet to 24 feet. Same thing yeah. I deal with. Ground speed is the one adjustment that's easiest to make. And I agree. I, I mean, so when I do this, I'll go to variegated orchards. They're doing pears, they're doing apples. They got every rootstock, every row spacing. And it's ridiculous for me to say, every two blocks, get out of the sprayer and adjust everything. I recognize that's not possible. Here's my suggestion. Consider your entire operation holistically as a whole and go, okay, all these trees are bigger than this. All these trees are smaller than this. And you can use that with tree row volume. I have this much volume on this acre. I have this much. Maybe there's a compromise. You have your sprayer set up two different ways. Everything above this, I spray to the worst case scenario. Everything below this, I spray to the worst case scenario. That saves you getting in and out of the sprayer, swapping nozzles, pressures, and speeds. But it's still better than nothing. So I do recognize that. Uh, travel speed is a great tool for air. It's also a great tool for changing your rate and your volume. Uh, pressure is not. I, I don't. Unless you're making little tweaks, um, don't mess around with pressure. Too many weird things happen that we don't need to get into. Better to change a nozzle for really big changes in flow to your operation. So I'm, I'm sorry, there's not a great answer there. You, you just try to make as few changes as possible. It might mean you change your driving order. It may not make sense for refills, but it will for calibration. The, your best friend here is a sharp pencil. Work out how much time it would take to do it one way, work out how much time the other. And that adds up. You'll have your answer. Great. Uh, another question here. Try to follow the label rate per acre, not necessarily the dilution rate. Is that not a thing to do? Or is that would, the point of what we should be doing? I don't have a clear <laughs> answer for that. This is where I'm going to bail and, and beg Terry to help. But there are some labels that already come out as a concentration. If I had the perfect label, here's the perfect label. Put this much formulated product per gallon or per liter of water. And use as much as that as you need to get your leaves to look like this. Never exceed this much per acre. It's, it's perfect. It tells you what our, our target is. It gives you a set concentration. And if your coverage matches their coverage, you win. Restricted entry, 
uh, maximum residue limits are all taken care of by the having the, the high-end limit. And the ability of the operators, is if you want to put extra time into making it more efficient, you get rewarded by saving spray mix. If you're making a dog's breakfast of it or your sprayer is a bad fit for the canopy, it's going to take more to get the job done as long as, again, you don't exceed it. So if you have a, a label that has a concentration on it, stick to it. Um, that's a step further than the per acre rate, and I have more faith in it. But, you know, you still have to figure out how much of that is enough, and then that's the coverage standard. So, uh, Terry, go ahead. Like, it's, it's opinion at this point. Yeah, well, I mean, there's very few labels that I've seen that have concentration. You know, it's, it's the PGRs, really. There's Katzerman, yeah. I think. There's Katzerman and plant growth modifiers. Yeah, I think yep. sulfur is getting there for, for grapes because I, if I understand how that works, it volatilizes. Like you need a certain amount of it around the crop to do the work. So you can't, you couldn't use a variable rate sprayer like a smart apply. Or they're working on that anyway. Because you underdose it. Yeah. So some of them, and I really wish we could give you a hardcore answer here, but some you mess with and some you don't. And I always drew the line of plant growth modifiers. You stick with concentration, but there's mm -hmm. no point missing the target. And typically, there's no point drenching it either. Yeah. And one thing that I often say, to, and, and uh, I'll add the asterisk here, I'm speaking for Vermont. Um, I know in Vermont, and I've, I've double checked this and triple checked this, um, you cannot, in no state can you over apply a material higher than the label rate. In Vermont, you are allowed to under apply. You can apply half doses. Some states haven't allowed that. And the real, the real reasoning behind that is if you do it, to save money and you're not paying attention and therefore you're just putting in half the stuff and doing what you usually did, you're setting yourself up in a lot of cases for potential resistance development. Um, here, here. Yeah, so don't, if you're going to back off rates or you're going to back off, you know, what you're putting out there, do it intelligently and make sure that you're covering the crop. Um, and then adjusting, and, and where we have this range of, of uh, uh, labels, you know, there's a lot of pieces that come into play, right? So if we're putting on, uh, you know, Marivon or, you know, one of these more expensive fungicides and it's going to be a quick rain and we know we just, but it's going to be a critical scab infection period. Well, a certain rate might be different than if you're going to have four days of rain, you want to get it established. Uh, so that's, it, it, you know, there it becomes, all of a sudden the math now is truly into, into high order calculus with all the different pieces you've got to put into play. Yeah, I'll, I'll blow your mind even more. If you, uh, if you try this with an ultra low volume sprayer, mm. the deposits, it, it changes, you can end up with, so if we consider dose to be how much product per, per, per unit area of a leaf, and we hit it with one big fat droplet, then we have, we have a certain dose. There's this much product on that much area of leaf. If we break that droplet, droplet up into eight droplets by going in half and spread it out, it's at the same concentration, but it'll cover twice the area. We've, all we've done is made the droplets smaller, we haven't changed the concentration or how much is sprayed per acre, but as long as they all land, we've doubled the area that covers. Believe it or not, we've half the dose in doing that. It's just mind boggling. Is that bad? Maybe not. Um, if that residue has time to stay wet and then the residue forms, depending on its mode of action, great. If you've got a wind or you've got a lot of um, bacterial action or, or, or something that breaks that residue down, it's not gonna last as long. So. You know, there's a whole other layer of nuance in this. This is why I try not to get lost in the weeds on this too much. If we look at the water sensitive paper, if we assume that everything we've done up to this point, the concentration has worked for us, we haven't had failures, we have to make an assumption somewhere, throw the same amount of product in the tank, assume that if all the water sensitive papers at minimum look like this, you're covered, and try to trim away all the fat then whatever that happens to be in water and product savings at the end of the day, that's what it happens to be. And that covers wind, it covers operator, it covers sprayer, and it covers plant growth. Just be prepared to keep checking and make changes on the fly. Once you get comfortable with that, it becomes second nature. Yeah, a pack of water sensitive cards is pretty cheap. Uh, we buy ours from Gemplers, but there's a lot of different uh, places to, to get them. Uh, and we do put them up. Uh, the other thing that we've done, because we've done some uh, organic work and I've kind of gotten away from that, but I still have bags of surround left the, the clay throw just a little bit of surround in there and you can see the coverage pretty well uh on your on your uh plants I have another question that's come up 
um, as someone who's new to spraying, well, let's answer this first question before I go to that one. What's the best way to attach water sensitive paper? Alligator clips, they asked. We've used, um, I don't know if I have any in here, you know, the, the binder clips, you know, we use Back. these sometimes, yeah. just have a box of those. I saw you had push pins. I've done lots of different stuff. I've even had a guy center together alligator clips uh, so that they're in the same orientation and some 90. Because when you mm. clip them to a branch, of course, they're never, the face isn't the right way. But I'll tell you this, it kind of doesn't matter. What you need right. to do is be consistent. Uh, I tie a bit of ribbon around the branch or the twig where I have the water sensitive paper. I'll spray one side and I won't take the paper off. I'll go have a look because you get to see what one pass does and what wind does. Then I'll come back and spray on the other side of the tree, I'll have a look. Really uh, uh, sparse orchards, I may spray a few rows and look at the cumulative impact. So however you pin them up, you pin the next one up when you make a change so that it's fair. And recognize that water sensitive paper is not a leaf, it's not an apple, it's much harder to get coverage on an apple than it is a leaf. Terrence mentioned the, uh, the hairs and the surface texture and the orientation. The paper is just a paper. So all you can do is compare papers to papers before and after. You may not even be able to compare one guy's orchard to somebody else's orchard. You have to compare within that orchard at that time. So however you put them up, pins, spring back paper clips, alligator clips, uh, just make sure you put the next set up the same way. Label mm -hmm. the back, take a minute to label the back so you know where you got it from. And what I do is I, I, I do this all the time for people. I open up a free Gmail account and I just take pictures of the papers and email them to you. So now they're, they're geocached, you know where they are, you know when you took them. And if you ever have to go back to figure out what went wrong or what went right, you crack into your Gmail account, you look at the pictures. Great idea. Yeah, I've got my Gemplers because I'm about to order my spray cartridges open anyway. I just looked at 27 bucks. Is, uh, there's some somewhat uh, generic ones from Spot On. It's not just the T-Jet ones, but for 25, about a buck a card. They all end up coming from Syngenta at some point, but there's a I disruptor bet. out of Brazil called WP Papers, or sorry, hmm. WS Papers. They just sent me a baggie. Um, they're designed to work in more humid environments. So they don't just go blue instantly. So I'm gonna try mm -hmm. them in greenhouses. I'm gonna compare them to the standard Syngenta and let you know. But my guess is that uh, spot on is just rebranding the same Syngenta. I paper. bet they are. And actually if you go, the per, per card, price is about not far off pretty yeah. similar and if anyone um, does go out and buy them pitch the book that comes with them those <laughs> those were written in the 50s by a scientist that was never identified for field crops so mm -hmm. stick with the 85 drops per square centimeter and 10 to 15 and 80 percent great all right so here's this question prior to this as someone who's new to orchard spraying do you calculate the area based on the reach of the sprayer the spacing of the rows or some other metric um I'm going to plug my book. Uh, I took, this is so hard to explain an, an image or a geometry with words, it would be cruel to even try. But we worked for a long time to try to draw pictures that would answer this question. It requires us to define what a swath is. It defines, so some people think it's from the center of the sprayer, both sides. Some people say one side. Some people say that it's the row spacing itself, no matter what the sprayer does. And for alternate rows, it's even bigger still. So I'm, I'm going to defer on that one. Download the book, it's free. Take a look at how we described it. There are a lot of different ways you can do this math, but whatever method you choose, stick with it. You can't mix or match different calibration math because the, the constants are different. So find something that makes sense for you and, and work from that. Um, maybe Terry's got something more basic to suggest. Maybe I overthought that. Well, I think yours is gonna be more nuanced. I've, we've always stuck to the, the standard, you know, the row width, um, but that doesn't take into account a lot of other pieces. Um, it's that, that same thing I showed with the, um, the uh, tree standard. row volume calculation, width of the trees, yeah. width of the row, yeah. you know, subtracts that's out. That's the 485 standard calculation and that's for taking the swath that's row width. The one yeah. we use has half that constant because we only look at one side of the sprayer. And the reason we right. decided to do that is because that works for guys with one-sided sprayers as well. Mm -hmm. Like it, that calculation will work for everybody, but most orchards are two sides or more. If you get a multi-row sprayer or a one-sided sprayer, those that math is wrong. So we chose something that we, we hoped would be universal. It makes it yep. a bit more complicated for typical operators, but it makes it useful for everyone. So whatever you pick, stick with it. 
So one question from Glenn Kaler here. What's wrong with the alternate row spring? Is it suitable <laughs> early in the season? I can't believe it took that long to come up. Um, it can totally work. And I've seen it work. And in fact, some states recommend it as an environmentally cool way to get the job done. But alternate row spraying requires certain conditions to succeed. It requires a sprayer that's laminar enough and has enough air energy to blow right through one, one entire target and deposit on both sides. And the inverse square law, getting all mental on you here, says that the further away you get from a sprayer, you exponentially lose coverage, you lose air. So that doesn't mean you won't get enough coverage on the far side of the tree to get it done. It just means you drench the side that's next to you and hope that conditions don't conspire to push you under the efficacy threshold on the far side. Here's another reason I don't like it. If you spray from both sides, you change your angle of attack. And they did this with grape works in New Zealand. They were getting the same shadows behind posts and grapes because they drove the same way up the same row over and over. And I, I won't say resistance, I can't say that, but they were losing efficacy because there were patches of the canopy that just were always shattered and never got sprayed. If you come up the other side, you get an entirely different angle of attack to prevent that. And lastly, it overlaps. So if mm -hmm. the, if the I orient myself, if I, my head's the tree and these are the two spray swaths from either side, as they pass, you're gonna get less and less coverage to the other side. That bit in the middle got hit twice. So you add it up and you end up getting more consistent coverage throughout the entire orchard. So lots of reasons that I'm telling you to beware, not, not do it. Just beware. The wind picks up, pest pressure increases, things get dry, or your sprayer is right on the edge of being able to pull this off. Get your water sensitive paper and be able to convince yourself the spray went where you thought it went. That's my yeah. beef with alternate row. One one trick, my old boss, who might, I don't know if he's on the uh, on the call here or not, uh, Mo Tugas taught me in the orchard, uh, paint the sides of your posts alternating colors. So that each time you're doing your alternate row, yeah. you're alternating the row you just sprayed and, and mark which one you did. So you get some of that extra, you know, you cover that that For overlap sure. you might not have gotten. Yep. George, did you want to add anything? You you, you took my words away. If you spray <laughs> down the row, next yep. time you spray up the row so that you're coming in at a different direction. So you get better coverage over the whole season. You know, Jason, uh, the alternate row center, the question I always get is, why can't we do it for the first two sprays of the year? Because there's no foliage out there. Can't we save? Sure. If you can prove that you got the spray there. You know, the, and if you're using water sensitive paper, then you have the proof that you're getting the yeah, coverage. It's no mm -hmm. problem. You just, you know what? Underlying everything I've ever told anyone uh, is prudent. You need the feedback. We're probably the only industry in the planet where we spend this much money and time and then wait for two weeks to figure out if it worked or not. Like that's no way to run a railroad. We mm -hmm. should know immediately if we've achieved what we think we've achieved. And if we haven't, be prepared to make changes until we do or put the sprayer away. No one likes to hear that, but sometimes that's the answer. So without that immediate feedback, we're just armchair calibrating here. We're just guessing. So okay. prove yourself. So I think if everybody would tie the ribbon on the opposite side of the tree and go out and have somebody check it a couple times uh, a season so that you know you're getting your coverage, you're gonna know if you're getting that blow through or if you're getting uh, the penetration with your air. And number two, use the water sensitive paper. It gives you a quantified aspect of you're doing a good coverage or not. You're spending thousands of dollars of putting stuff in the tank. What's another $20 of finding out if you're getting the coverage you're getting or not? Well, I owe you a beer, George. Thanks for the backup. Don't retire. <laughs> <laughs> With that, I think we're about to hit our 130 limit. Uh, so I want to absolutely thank you, Jason, because this was, would have been a much more boring talk if uh, everyone were to hear just me talk about this. And uh, yeah, keep that the look up the uh, sprayers 101 in the in the chat here. Um, I, I highly recommend it. I now have a copy. And again, we're talking 30 bucks worth of stuff between a $26 pack of papers and a few rolls of tape. Yeah, um, and if that's right. If that's the only thing we do, um, 
will already be better. And then we can kind of follow up from that. So uh, yeah, I want to thank everyone. And hopefully we'll see everyone next week when we uh, discuss the uh, rollout of NEWA 2.0. And uh, otherwise, have a great day. Thanks for having me. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Hey, Terry. Yes. So I'm assuming, I think he addresses this in the book, but I got to check. You can just use regular flagging tape. You don't need, at one point, he's talking about heavier ribbons. But that oh, yeah, no, I think the, is okay, yeah, right? Yeah, I think flagging tape is fine. I think, I think that's a Canadian term for flagging tape or something. I'm not sure. Um, well, oh, George, you got a point? Yeah, he doesn't like to use the flagging tape on the sprayer, but ribbon, the old fashioned. On the sprayer. Uh, old fashioned ribbons because uh, flagging tape may break and be sucked back into it where a cloth, the cloth ribbon will not break and it won't be sucked into the fan as much. And he's also looking at that 10 to 12 inches long, not longer. So what do you gotcha. mean old fashioned ribbon, George? What do you like mean? a ribbon. Tear up some t-shirts or something or? Well, it's usually the ribbons that were a quarter of an inch wide by uh, buy it in a spool. Uh, you know, it's it's not as heavy as a, a, a t-shirt or that. It's you know the other one that I always use is the ribbon I use to wrap Christmas presents with. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah, I get that. That makes sense. A little more rugged because the plastic stuff, the air air blast can blow it right off. All right. right. Yeah. yeah, it doesn't it need to be heavy. Also, you have confetti tough. up in the tree. Right. Yeah, Roger said in the chat there, yeah, tie a yellow ribbon around the old oak tree. <laughs> <laughs>